some areas I didn't get, I didn't make to the back back there, but um, I trust y'all to follow closely today. <clears throat> I'm going to try to do what I determined to be the uh, second part of really what we dealt with last week, talking about blessing, uh, blessing our children, blessing our families, and today I just I want to zero in on I guess something that's always I don't know, it gets my attention a lot lately. Uh, that's about submission. So I want to talk about the submission factor today. And we're going to look at several passages of Scripture, and uh, so we're going to be kind of moving around a little bit. So if you don't get to turn to it today, uh, I apologize for that, for that already. As we were singing the song, Trust, Obey, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way. That's kind of a, I don't want to keep popping up in my mind and in my conversation. It's a very important uh, song that we sing, uh, part of our tradition, but it's, but it's a testimony of, of who we are and what we believe. And we believe that if we trust God and obey Him, that there's really no other way to be happy in the kingdom as to trust and obey. And really it has a lot to do with what I'm talking about today. I had, a, I had an illustration that I was going to story that I was going to share with you, but it's a little bit too long today. But I'm glad you chose that song, Trust, Obey. It has a lot to do with submission, the submission factor that we're going to talk about today. So I want to just ask you this morning, and I know we're not going to have time for a response, but how do you feel about submission? How do you feel about devotion, being submitted and devoted? to anything, to someone. There's many facets of life that require commitment, submission, devotion. But to submit one's self requires us to yield. To yield to the authority or the will of another individual. To come under someone and to be accountable you think about it, this is actually against our nature, our natural self. We really like to be on our own. I'm not going to be so, so much to say that you're like the uh, young man that said he was tired of people telling him what to do. And so he just said, I'm going to join the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> That's always been a really... And it's probably a lot of us have done that sort of thing. <laughs> but even to be a viable part of God's church, think about this. We must be submissive to Jesus Christ. That's one of the master requirements, if you will. Because he's the master of our life in all respects of our living. And we submit to him. He's our Lord. We must also be willing to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's one of the major commandments. And we must be willing to love one another as well as the entire body of Christ. You know, sometimes everybody's not as lovely as we are, are they? But we're to love one another. We must be devoted to loving the things that our God loves and hating the things that He hates according to the Scriptures. And we're to be willing to give of our time and our talents and finances, at least a tenth or more of all that God blesses us with, we're committed to do that. And if we're married, to be submissive to one another. You see in your notes there, this is actually the essence of all things sacred that matters to God. And your family, as far as that goes, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this morning... My desire is to talk particularly about what it means for to be a fully devoted, surrendered follower of Christ. A true lover of the Heavenly Father. You know what, there's times in all of our lives where we have to stop and reevaluate that. Even though we, today that would be our testimony, we get tested in this life. Sometimes we get off track and we wonder even in our spirit, our mind. And yes, we're still talking about this theme of blessing, as I said earlier. 
That is the giving or the speaking of a blessing on another individual. It's an encouraging affirmation to them. And yes, yes, we're going to just continue to talk about this and the, and the giving and the speaking of the blessing this morning. And I, I just want you to consider that. And I want to begin by just maybe by asking y'all uh, a little bit of a side question. We're going to talk a little bit about an illustrated point. And that is, how many of you, and Jimmy, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to be all right with this now. How many of you at least uh, had one subject in school that you dreaded? It was history, or English, or literature, or for me it was math, amen? Anybody in here hate P.E.? I think we get a lot on that one. We look forward to that. I was, I was our out many times. But anyway, there was this one high school boy, and I wanted to share with you a little bit about what went on with him. He was having a particular hard time with geometry. I did have to go to summer school on that one, I think. It was the worst hour of his day, and so here he was as a senior, and he just knew he was going to flunk the course, mainly because his teacher had the same opinion. <laughs> but, but, but his one consolation was that about half of the class was going to flunk with him. I mean, if y'all had that feeling before. The teacher went on as far as the place in that small group, uh, that, that, half, that half of the class, that put them in the back of the room, just kind of set them aside. However, one glorious Monday morning after dragging themselves to the classroom, every, everything seemed to change because sitting behind the desk that morning was the substitute teacher. Amen. <laughs> We, we always looked forward to that, and I liked that idea until I became one, and then I, I kind of knew what was going on. But anyway, this, this substitute teacher, a little to their knowledge that day, she's going to remain, or he's going to remain with them until the term was over. The original teacher had been reassigned to another school district, and wow, were they elated. Can you just imagine? Everyone felt like they had been liberated in some, I don't know, in some fashion for sure, that's for sure. But they must have been ecstatic. They, got a, they had a new teacher. But the only problem that remained was that still this half of them were still well in the course. That, that stayed with them. But something new the teacher said that morning literally changed this young boy's life, even many in the classroom. In fact, it motivated him to the point that he ended up, and you get this, this kid that hated geometry, he ended up minoring in mathematics in college. So what in the world did that teacher say to him? Well, at the time, this one student could not have realized the impact of what had happened, really. But this new teacher had actually spoken a blessing into his life. It came unplanned. Uh, at least on his part, he didn't know what was coming, and so, so did the rest of the students. But it literally transformed, transformed many of them, and even their perspective of, of geometry changed. Here's what the teacher said to them. Maybe you've heard this before. This teacher said, if anyone fails this class, then I too will have failed. It revolutionized their life. It transformed them in the way they thought. Uh, and, and of course, it just started then. And they began to change. So now we see what happened here. This, this high school teacher, in essence, had made a vow to do whatever it would take to see that each of the students passed the course. First of all, by staying after school to tutor them if necessary and, and even coming in on the special sessions on the weekend. Whatever it took, he let them know, I'm willing to do this. I will sacrifice for you. I want you to pass. And they loved it. And they respected the teacher for it. So can you imagine you just the turnaround in the class, how the whole atmosphere changed? where once they dreaded coming into the class, now they look forward to it. 
And when the year came to an end, the graves were posted, and guess what? They all passed. They all passed, first of all, because the man's words of, of blessing. And secondly, they, it was accompanied by a willingness of this teacher to give of himself and to see it through. He was willing to do whatever it took. And in the beginning, he had promised it. And in the end, they saw he had, he had followed through. We all know that words alone are rarely enough because words should be backed up by genuine love. And I want to just say, not just feelings, but active love, wherein he followed through and when he spoke this blessing. He added support to their life and to, and to see that the words that he spoke came to fruition. That is so important. And that's one of the main things that I want to leave with us today. Follow through with what we promise, with genuine love. And by the way, love is always, genuine love is always active. It always is active. Now, don't you believe the Apostle James? You, you've heard this scripture before. In, in your notes, I, I, I put the reference down, James 2.15. He's right on target, I believe. He says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. And then he says, what use is that? The truth is, children of all ages need to have carefully chosen words of blessing spoken to them, but Mere words alone won't do it. That's not enough. We've all experienced that in our life, probably. And there needs to be some action taken which will only come through intentional love and follow-up on behalf of the originator of the blessing. So what can we do? What can we do in order to make this sort of impact on a young life? First of all, there in your notes, Submit the person being blessed to the Lord. Submit the person being blessed to the Lord. Very important. Because you can't do this on your own. You can't force an individual child or anybody else to do or be something that you want. This is what God's people do. We submit these individuals that we love and are concerned about, to the Lord. Isaac blessed Jacob. We talked about him last week. And years later, uh, we see there in Genesis 48, Jacob submitted his children and grandchildren to the Lord. And he said this in, in verse 15. He says, The God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. And then he said, Bless these lads of mine. He submitted them to the Lord. Amen. He submitted his children to the Lord. And then he said, God, would you do what only you can do? Would you bless my children? Evidently, these patriarchs of old understood the value of active love and blessing children. And we as well, you and I are sitting here today under the sound of my voice. We must not allow our children to grow up without understanding this same virtue. That is the value, the value of active love. We must not let them down. We can't let them down. We must let them know that we will be with them to see the blessing through. As much as is in our power and authority before God Almighty, we will be there for them and help them through difficult times, good times and bad times. So as wise parents, we will model this practice and we will pass it down into the generations of our family if we know what's good for us. And our children and our, and, and our devotion uh, will effectively teach them that God is personally concerned with their lives and their welfare as we submit the one being blessed to the Lord. We'll let them know that God will be their very best friend as they learn, and here we go again, to trust and obey. We must teach them what we say we believe. Secondly, in your notes, we should...
should devote our own lives to the best interest of our children. Devote our own lives to the best interest of our children. Not least of all, we can, we can take another lesson from the saints of old, I believe, in that they recognized that every one of their children was unique. Have you noticed that in your own families? And they intentionally developed these young lives accordingly, regarding whatever their uniqueness and giftedness happened to be. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 28 says, This is what their father Jacob said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, each one, with the blessing appropriate to them. Amen. So important. Our blessings may be worded similarly, but applications should be unique to the individual person. None of them are, no two of them are alike. You see, one daughter may need a dozen hugs and kisses at night before going to bed, while the sister may do well with just two. Even the sons might feel secure with hearing a few encouraging words once in a while, but his brother might need to hear things over and over again, like, you can do it, you can do it. Are you listening to me, son? You can do it. One may be prone towards sports and the other one might be prone towards the arts. We must check them out and be careful. And so wise parents will pay close attention to the uniqueness of their children, each of them, which is precisely what the writer of Proverbs says. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I remember hearing it preached on and studied on a little bit myself. But this, this proverb that we all are familiar with, in Proverbs 22, 6, says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, I'm told that even that verse has so much to do with the unique giftedness of that child. And we need to train up our child in such a way that we understand them, and we train them in that way that they should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. He'll know what he's gifted and trained to do. He'll be good at it, or she'll be good at it. And even so, as parents, we will not effectively accomplish this by simply uh, being in close proximity to the child. We have to know them. We have to have personal knowledge about them. And then we can help them develop whatever their bent happens to be. Just remember, it's the taking of your valuable time to devote, to devote yourself to their best, best interest. And in your notes, and maybe we will be willing to do what is best for the child, particularly correcting them when their conduct could possibly just jeopardize themselves and others <coughs> around them. I'm talking about appropriate discipline, of course, according to the scriptures. Scripture teaches so much on this. Sparing the rod and spoiling the child, we always remember that. It's not always the appropriate discipline, but it can, can very well be appropriate. And we need not to try to invent the wheel. We know we're talking about God, who is the creator of us all, and he knows us all well. His brother Jimmy just prayed while ago. He knows everything about us, even the hairs on our head are numbered. And I don't think that's just gesturing. He actually does. He knows us that well. He knows everything about us. He knows how we are. But don't cheat your child out of this necessity according to the Creator. Because you see, it's a vital part of demonstrating your parental active love and your blessing. The Bible reminds us, in your notes, I, I put this reference as well, of Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. We're, we've all read this probably before, but, it's, but this is the opinion of God. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And whom the parent loves, regarding his children, well, of her children. You love them. And so you'll correct them. And as parents, we have to be willing to run the risk that discipline and correction will ultimately bring out the best in anyone, especially our children. And when we, with, when we withhold this appropriate correction, it amounts to no less than
lying to our children about what's right and what's wrong in their life. They need to know. They need to have clarity in their minds. They don't need to have this extra confusion about what's right and what's wrong. Because to, I think, to avoid this or to withhold this is just another dirty trick of Satan. Scripture says in closing, we've all heard this, you know this, I preached on it not too awfully long ago, but it has to do with the truth. Because we all know that it's the truth that will set not only us free, but it will set our children free to be all that God intends for them to be as well. <coughs> I pray that today after we, uh, uh, after we have brought this message uh, on blessing and and speaking words of encouragement to our children that you'll take it and you'll you'll use it in your life. Don't let it slide. You only get one. You only get one shot at it. And how many of you in here know that our children grow up really fast? I tell you, they grow up really fast. And those that you're rocking on, on you, maybe in your arms and sitting bouncing them on your knee, you'll be looking at them eye to eye before long. So bless them while you can. Speak those words of encouragement. They'll never forget, and they'll bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you again for uh, the words that you've given us to consider today in, in the scriptures. That you will bless these parents and individuals in here today, uh, some parents, grandparents, and others. That as we speak words to those that we love, and especially our children, that you will take them and you use them, and, and you will use them to bring them close to yourself, and they'll always be encouraged in the Lord, encouraged in the Word of God. They'll know where their, where their strength comes from. We thank you again for being so good to us, and we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.